So um, you'll know us by the southern accent for Laura Eastwood. And, and I'm Jessica Baker. I do not have the southern accent. Sometimes we introduce ourselves as a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> you'll, you'll see that Jessica is actually quite a lot rock and roll. Um, so we started this um, alt library programming initiative about four years ago now. And today we're just going to take you through some of the programs we've done and some of the ones we'd like to do. Um, yeah, so interrupt us with any questions you might have. Jessica? I think, I think we're ready to get started. I don't, I don't have much to add to that. If, if you guys could just stay, stay a little bit closer to the mic, that would be great. Okay. Otherwise, you sound great. All right, so uh, first we're going to start with some library stereotypes. As you can see here, we have that hushed hall of books. And uh, to counter that, the other slide we have is where I used to go to my undergrad, UCSD, that's the Geisel Library. It was also used in the movie Attack of the Killer Tomatoes as the spaceship for the Killer Tomatoes. So it was built by Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, but it's, it's a pretty fantastic. And then other stereotypes. This one is actually legitimate clip art. This is what a librarian looks like if you look in clip art. So that's not how we want to be presenting ourselves. And then this one is, of course, me. Um, I skate roller derby as lipstick librarian. So that's, uh, that's my introduction move is shushing the crowd, much to everybody's entertainment. So back when we decided we wanted to do programs for people in their 20s and 30s, we just assumed that people in their 20s and 30s weren't really using the library. And um, after we started our, our program series with that assumption and started getting some crowds coming to, to our programs, we actually, after the fact, uh, ran a cardholder report and found out that, in fact, uh, people in that age group actually made up a really large percentage of our population. So um, we were totally wrong in our assumptions. And I think the Pew Internet study that, that came out not too awful long ago really supports that. Um, and you can find the link to that in the notes of this uh, PowerPoint, which will be sent out later. But um, they weren't coming for programs, these people in their 20s and 30s. And our audience in particular is... This is the idea we have of our 20s and 30s person. So we've got the uh, anatomy of a hipster here, very entertainingly. Um, but we learned an important lesson. Do not, do not call, call them a hipster. It will never work. You will never sell it. And then here, the handmade nation. I, as most of you probably know, the DIY movement was getting really big and very popular. Um, people were getting interested in, in making things themselves and doing the things themselves, and that's, that's where we started to try to appeal to this audience, because, I mean, what's more do-it-yourself than the library? And because we are the library, we borrowed things from other, other successful folks uh, presenting programs for people in their 20s and 30s, both in library settings and in the, uh, the um, public world. So a couple of programs you might want to take a look at are Genre Acts out of Oak Park, Illinois. They have a great program series concentrating on a book club and then a few, few programs around that. And then the Fresh City Life program um, at Denver Public. We also look to uh, a few private organizations like the Make Lounge in London for programming ideas and Workshop SF. So these are organizations that definitely are geared toward the um, sort of convivial getting together, meeting, making things, doing things, interacting with one another. Uh, they're, they're mostly craft-based, those two. So one of the biggest lessons that we learned is that timing is everything. You can't have midday programs. Most of the people in their 20s and 30s are at work. So you need to be able to time it. You don't want it too late. They'll have gone out for the night. So we, we learned with great trial and error when to time our programs. Most people don't want to come in on Saturdays. Uh, it's usually weeknights after work before going out that seems to be the best. So be aware 
of when you can find people in your library and then cater to them then. Don't try to get them in when you would like it or when it would be more convenient for you. Sunday afternoons have been really successful as well um, for some of our programs like uh, speed dating, which we'll talk about later. But be careful of what Sundays you pick. We um, rather <laughs> infamously scheduled a speed dating event on Super Bowl Sunday one year, and that was um, it could be a disaster, but actually we got a good crowd of, of attendants. So um, Alt Library is for the most part a totally grassroots effort. Our programming is staff created. Uh, we try to get people to use their own passions. Um, so Jessica creates programs that she really likes, and they tend to be uh, fitness based. I handle all the uh, crafty stuff uh, with a lot of Jessica's help. Um, we also try to make sure that everything is very affordable. We're trying to create programs that are um, cheap for the library to produce and yet still fun for people to attend. So we aim at $1.50 per person um, for our programming budget and for the most part have kept within that by not hiring uh, external presenters. Um, we don't consider the, the, the staff costs. So we adapt that craft business model for the library's use. We also try to make as much use as possible of free online marketing. Um, there is some paid, but we've created relationships with our local free newspaper, the SNNR. Um, they have featured Jessica in their, their pages as, what was it? I was best librarian, best librarian to bring the pain. So that was for her fitness programs and for um, the uh, roller derby role that she has. Uh, we have a Facebook account. The live, we use the library's Facebook, so it has 4,000 um, uh, likes. Uh, we also put some of our crafts on Instructables and uh, just try to maintain a, a broad and varied web presence. Occasionally we use uh, interns and volunteers to make sure to post all of our things to online campus. Um, we do limited print materials, and we'll talk a bit about those later. We found that even if we spend a lot of money on print stuff, um, we don't see a lot of return on investment for those. Okay, so this is uh, me, Jessica, on the morning show as librarian, and one of the things that we've learned is you have to be willing to be a personality. You have to be absolutely shameless in your promotion of the library. You have to increase awareness by any means necessary. And increasing awareness is part of our Sacramento Public Library strategic plan. That's one of our very first goals because if people don't know about you, they can't support you. So I've gone on television a bunch of times. I've gone on radio shows, Capital Public Radio, Radio Disney. Um, I've done comedy club shows where they, they kind of roast me. Um, I do roller derby as lipstick librarian, and I do library card drives. You know, if you show your library card, you can get $10 off your ticket. Um, and then the community profile that Lori mentioned earlier in the, the Sacramento News and Review. So being available to be a presence is definitely going to help build that community because people will start to recognize you and they will come in thinking, oh my gosh, what are these people doing next? And this is where I get to jump in and, and tell you all that, that Jessica does not have a ginormous head. Um, she does this kind of at, at great personal cost. She doesn't really like being on television, but she's way better at it than I am. And I get to do all the behind the scenes thing and think about the money and all of the uh, justifying the programming that we're doing. We do have a really um, a supportive administration, but being able to um, just really talk to that, that goal number one, the strategic plan, that what we're doing is creating an awareness in the library so that when we go and ask for an increase in our taxes um, in a couple of years, we'll have this base of people in their 20s and 30s, hopefully willing to vote for the library. So. The main way we um, get membership um, and people to come to our events is using meetup.com. So if you're not familiar with Meetup, it is free to use. Um, 
as, as a meetup member for meetup groups, it's about $144 a year. So that's not terribly expensive. We have about 460 members at the moment. And they found our meetup um, looking for book clubs, looking for events for singles. We have a bunch of different tags on there. So the benefits of using Meetup is it gives us a kind of online space, uh, a place where we can mass email for each program, and our events can be picked up by other Meetup groups. So we've partnered with a much larger Meetup um, called SAC Geeks. Uh, they have, I think, almost 2,000 members by this point. So we make sure to cross-promote our events on their website. And they have been some of the most supportive of our, our membership. So it's, Meetup has been, been great. Um, it's part of the reason why we haven't had to print so many um, materials, flyers, and spend the time to put them all around town is because we have that go-to online place. Um, I would say that the, um, the usership of Meetup tends toward the older end of the 20s and 30s. So when we try to get people in their 20s, it's through the, the promotion that we do at local universities and in the library, things like that. So uh, just back to the 20s and 30s, the hipster person, we tend to um, try to program for ourselves, which is people, eh, you know, just, just north of 30, um, without children and wanting to go out and do things in their community. So. Uh, we've also had great success getting that same group of people that we uh, get to come to programs to actually uh, do some work for us. So we've used Volunteer Match to, to gather volunteers and our altlibrary.com blog. So um, the, we did a call for volunteers to do some of our promotional materials. We, when we first started, we did not have an in-house graphic designer. So we were a little strapped for cool looking things. And if you'll see on this, this is about as good as our drawing gets. So uh, we needed a little help there. And we managed to get some good graphic design, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then the next component to that is the Alt Library Friends Group. So we started the Friends Group in 2012, and this has been a challenge for us because having a Friends Group that is not tied to a branch, so that you can't do the traditional fundraisers in the branch like the book sale or whatever else, has, has been tricky trying to figure out how we're going to raise money and do events. So they've been doing online book sales and, and trying to raise money. We have plan for May, an alt prom. We're looking very forward to this. The theme is going to be time after time. It's going to be different decades. We've got a photographer that we've worked with multiple times willing to do the cheesiest photo booth of all time with that great neon splatter background. But this is going to be our first major fundraiser for the Alt Library Friends Group. And in order to make this self-sustaining, you do need to have friends. You do need to have that support. And like Lori said earlier, this is what's going to get us voted for in the future. This is what's going to approve bond measures and keep the library alive and relevant. In the bottom corner of the screen, you'll see something interesting that came from one of our online partnerships um, with Sat Geeks. They put together a deck of cards uh, for meetup groups and clubs throughout Sacramento. Each uh, organization purchased one card. Um, I think ours was like the Seven of Clubs, and we were able to put uh, this little advertisement on the back of it, and then they scattered these cards throughout town and tried to create a collecting thing. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about the alt prom later, but that will also be a way to uh, raise our profile and get members who are old friends. So back to the graphics. This was our first um, graphic. This round image here we put on coasters and put those in bars and coffee shops uh, throughout town. And then on the reverse we had a list of our uh, then book clubs and the programs we had going on. So those were hugely successful. People really liked them. We overprinted um, 
really um, buy a lot, I have these. So we tend to take them to presentations and I've got them on my desk. But this was a crowdsourced um, graphics contest. We said that we would, of course, feature the winning design on, uh, on things spread throughout Sacramento, as well as on our, our blog. So that was, we didn't get a ton of submissions, but you know, a dozen or so. We tried to make it a community thing. So I, I think that half of our submissions were from online and about half were from people in the community. That last flyer, um, or poster as the case may be, was also the demise of using the phrase in their 20s and 30s because we found it was too restrictive and people who were in their late 30s or early 40s or beyond wouldn't come to the programs. And granted, we are trying to target people in their 20s and 30s, but we don't want to restrict it. Library services are for everyone. So we've got our flyers here for speed dating for book lovers. and. This is something that I was really opposed to doing. It's a lot of work, but it's very, very popular. People are so interested in this, and they love to come to it. And here we have two community-created flyers. So the one on the left is a friend and downstairs neighbor of mine who created it. Um, and it's, you know, it's very eye-catching. It's what people in this age demographic are going to be interested in finding. Most of the generically developed library illustrations are targeted at families or at kids or at you know somebody who's already using the library. We're trying to use images to get people in. So I believe the second annual one was the one that was on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, not, not our smartest plan. And then the one on the right was the first one that we ever did and we had same-sex speed dating. And in case you are not aware, generally with speed dating you can have the men stay in one place and the women move around the room. Same-sex speed dating, you have to write an algorithm to make sure everybody meets up. We're willing to share that if anybody wants to do it, but it was, I found myself on the ground with crumpled bits of paper all around me trying to figure out mathematically how everybody could meet everybody else. So we've already worked that out. You don't need to worry about it. We can, we can share that. But challenges like that are things that you don't expect. But both of these flyers were very popular, got a lot of interest, and, uh, and were designed for free by members of the community in exchange for the promotion. So be shameless in asking for what you need, and people will generally provide. Jessica? Yes. I know you mentioned that, or I, or I guess either of you can answer this. So you mentioned the, the one event was done during Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday, which was probably not, <laughs> like you said, the, the best thing. Um, have you done other programs during the afternoon, and and has that worked, or do you do you still tend to stick with programs during the evening? No, actually, we have done quite a few programs on Sunday afternoon. Seem to be the best. Some of our craft programs are Sunday afternoons. We did um, broke ass holidays uh, last year, and it was a big success. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you have to be aware of some um, audience creep when you schedule things on an afternoon. Though with a title like Broadcast Holidays, we were pretty um, pretty safe with our audience. Okay. Um, and another thing about speed dating, this is maybe one of the times where we would have liked to have limited our audience to people in their 20s and 30s. But again, because we're a library and we're open to all, we did not do that. So. Um, comment that we get most when we do a speed dating event is that they that the range of uh, ages was just far too wide. Uh, Jessica's going to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. We had uh, an interviewer from the San Francisco Chronicle paper call to ask us about that and ask us about the age ranges. And, you know, generally you'd think it wouldn't be a huge deal, but when you have somebody in their 20s, meeting up as a potential date for somebody in their 70s, it's not exactly <gasps> Wow. Yeah, that was, that was a little bit uncomfortable, but everybody, everybody took it with good humor. And like Lori said, we are the library. We're open to everyone. We're not a speed dating organization, so we're not going to limit ourselves, but it still comes out a little bit tricky. 
so we decided to uh, do speed friending for book lovers as a ancillary program to the speed dating. Uh, some of the folks, we always have more women than men who want to attend these, funnily enough. Um, and so the women in the first round ended up talking to one another and wanting, wanted to exchange their information. So speed friending was a way to um, get around some of the awkwardness with the age with, um, without having to do limits. Uh, it was also even harder to get people to come to a thing called speed friending because that doesn't really exist. Uh, <laughs> we made that up. Uh, it was fun and we had about 30 attendees, but it was on the smaller side of attendance. So. And now on to the Alt Library Book Club, which has been our longest running and most successful program. And we found that the key to, to doing programs like this is to have regular events, building an audience and a community. So we're up to our fourth annual speed dating event. Doing it every year, people start to expect it. And they ask, are you doing it next year? I missed it last year. When are you going to do that again? So having that awareness and making sure that you repeat things regularly is going to be incredibly useful for building. Um, so our Alt Library Book Club has originally was called Books books, bars, beans, books, yeah, just something stupid. But the idea was to get it out into the community, have people meeting up in bars, in coffee shops, and having the library outside of the actual building. So here you can see some of the titles we've chosen. We try to choose a pretty large variety, fiction, nonfiction, cult titles, the unappreciated classics, things like that. Uh, Geek Love is one that Lori and I have both read and loved and probably should have reread before suggesting as a book club title because it's got, you know, necrophilia, incest, all sorts of great entertaining things like that. Um, but mostly the titles are called Things Lori and Jess Like. And, uh, but it's been relatively popular. We have a steady group of people coming and you get strange people dropping in and dropping back out again. But we have a pretty consistent group of about 12 or so people which Bigger than that, it's hard to have a successful book club without splitting off into smaller groups. But that's been running basically all four years now. Uh, we got money to buy book clubs in a box, which is 15 or so titles in a container that one person can check out and then hand out the books, gather them up the next time, and bring another box. That way, handing people the title means that they feel responsible and they're more likely to come back. So that has been incredibly useful for us as well. In addition, we're getting these titles into the library that we only have maybe one or two copies of. Now suddenly people are reading them and we have a whole bunch more available. So that's been a lot of fun for us. Uh, so here's the scene of one of our biggest failures, a series of programs called Hipster Crafts. It was kind of a book binding in disguise. We made magic journals. We had a record. We did a Coptic binding stitch. Um, it was really awesome and a fail, so we, we did it again and called it Retro Crafts. It was a huge hit. So, um, yeah, Retro Crafts, exact same crafts, much more successful, and it was one of our first Friday program series. So again, the, the regularity of programming with the first Friday program series, it's something that we started when I was a branch manager of a small branch in a less attractive neighborhood, and everybody thought, oh no, you're never going to get people to come in that neighborhood after hours. But our first one, let's see where we have that in here. We'll talk about it later, but the first one was our Bollywood Spectacular, and we had 60 people show up after hours. I don't know that I ever had 60 people in my library when I was open, so that was actually really incredibly impressive. But you can see the design for the Retro Crafts flyer was done by our graphic designer. It was much more attractive, much more interesting, and people, people picked it up. Ladies, where do you uh, purchase the book clubs in a box? Those, uh, those are done internally with our collection development department. Um, we were able to get a little bit of funding from our library director for alt library titles, and we for the library system as a whole, they choose uh, high-interest titles that are great for book clubs. 
So the alt library um, things we choose tend to be a little outside the collection development policy. Um, they don't circulate as much when they're made into a book club in a box. And if your uh, typical library book club got a hold of some of these, I think that they might be uh, shocked. Um, they're not terrible titles or anything, but I do think that we have to think pretty um, strategically about the things we, we purchase that are going to be the club in a box because they take up so much space and they are pretty expensive. Sure. But like Jessica said, they are the way we have grown this book club audience. And instead of making them circulate as a book club in a box, after our meetup, we tend to break them up and put them into the library collection so that each branch has a copy of Geek Club rather than 15 copies in a box. Okay, great. All right, so this slide is an example of iris folding. If you've never done it, looks super fancy, is super easy. And we do a lot of what I like to call lazy programs, things that garner pretty big numbers without a huge investment of time or money or effort. So iris folding is definitely one of those things. People love doing it. It's really easy. Kids can do it, and it makes it fancy. You know, it's good for a holiday card, come Valentine's Day, or come Christmas, or whatever else. And another one that I did was called Women in Rock. And this one was a total ripoff. I got hundreds of people at this program that was really just me playing a different song in the library every day. So I had created a poster with 30 different women for Women's History Month, 30 different female rock artists. I didn't put any names on it and said, every day in the library at 3 o'clock, we're going to play a different rock song from a woman in rock. If you can identify all 30, you'll win a $30 gift card to iTunes. That was provided by the friends of my library. And so this is a way for me to get huge program numbers, which, as we all know, you always need the statistics. But it didn't require anything beyond creating a free playlist online, playing one song a day, putting together a picture, and hanging it up in my library. And did you call this iris folding? Yes, that craft is called iris folding. Okay. And um, I highly recommend you Google it. Okay, <laughs> it, thank you. It, it changes library lives. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, Women in Rock was also picked up a lot by the local uh, local bloggers, and it was on the morning mm -hmm. show. So uh, it was just a simple little thing that Jessica thought up, uh, cheating to get great numbers for her branch, and turned into um, a good way to uh, promote. So another great way to promote is uh, by having a risque title. Shocking people. Shocking people is definitely going to sell. Um, naming programs is absolutely how you're going to get people in. And this one was the source of much discussion. Like Lori said earlier, we have very, very supportive administration. We're incredibly lucky with that. And this is not the way that we wanted to print it out. As you can see, we called it Broke Ass Holidays. Because we knew that people would think, oh my gosh, what is Broke Ass Holidays? That sounds fantastic. Holiday crafts? Ah. It sounds like something you're going to do with your kids, which is fine, but not what we were shooting for. We wanted the S's to be dollar signs. It would have been much funnier. They decided to go with asterisks, which, as far as I'm concerned, looks a little bit obscene, but that's, that's the decision that they made. So, uh, so we stuck with that. But we ended up getting about 70 people on a Sunday afternoon instead of the, you know, couple of kids that might normally have come in for a, a holiday craft program. Iris folding was featured, of course, <laughs> as well as embroidered postcards, which looks pretty sedate and had been a program that I did to much um, acclaim amongst the 60 plus set um, when it was called embroidered postcards. But uh, people in their 20s and 30s really loved it. And it's, it's a lot of fun, though I don't recommend mailing uh, a postcard that you spend 40 minutes making. So another of our successful programs, and this one was stolen from another library system, um, was Bad Art Night. And this is another of those yearly events. Bad Art Night is always a success. And this is the way to use up all of the junk that's sitting around in your craft. 
So the first flyer, the sad clown, is one that Lori had painted because she has the art skills in this relationship, not me. And it is always successful. People love it. They wrote um, articles about it and did photos the first year that we did it. But you have to be aware of the family creep. There will be families who want to come in. And sometimes it's fantastic. They'll do it all together, and it's really fun. And then the flyer that you see here was sign number two, in which we forgot to print it because this was an adult program. So we did have family show up to this, it, which was not terrible. It was 6.30 at night. So um, we did get mostly people in their 20s and 30s. Um, for Bad Art Night, we always give a paint-by-numbers kit as the prize for the worst art. And you can see one of our examples here. Um, we do good, bad, and ugly. So three categories, because some of the art is just too good to be bad art. They are amazingly skilled. Some of the art is just appallingly bad. And that's where the junk in your craft closet comes from. If you have a thousand million puffy stickers that you need to get rid of, now's the time to do it. If you have used up, dried up old glitter glue, now's the time to use it. So we let the contestants vote. We give everybody a sticker and say, you know, use the red sticker for good, the yellow sticker for bad, the blue sticker for ugly, and everybody gets to vote. So that way, no matter what, people feel involved. We take pictures, we post them online, we let people feel like this is really important. Uh, and then the alt fitness. And that one, I admit, is totally mine. Uh, Punk Rock Aerobics is our second longest running program series. And it was originally staff-led, all done by me. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, I skate roller derby. I also coach roller derby. And I am in the certification process to become a personal trainer. I love being a librarian. I don't want to stop being a librarian. I just really like working out. So we started with Punk Rock Aerobics. That was the first one. And we get about 40 people at these events. I've also done uh, Bollywood aerobics. I've done heavy metal yoga, which was very popular. We had people come in quartz paint. If you're not familiar with quartz paint, it's another, you should Google it. But it's the black and white face paint that a lot of metalheads like to wear. And when people showed up at the program, I thought, oh, this is, this is good. This is successful. We also had a hair metal yoga where I had businessmen in Jack Leopard shirts and neon spandex show up to stretch out. And that's surprising because generally you definitely have a gender bias when it comes to fitness programs. It's something that women will attend over men. And that tends to be the case in libraries a lot anyhow, is that women are more likely to attend than men. So we try to make sure that we have things appealing to both genders. And so like I said, this was originally staff-led. I was running all of them. And then I started moving into community partnerships. So I had brutal recess with a local gym body tribe, a guy that I'd met somewhere, I think he came into roller derby, and I said, you know, you should come in and do an alt fitness program for the library. So they're a gym, it's a great opportunity for them to promote their services, but they're offering a free class in the library. So that was a really well attended one. And then we had a holiday temptation smash with Mad Dog Megan, who's another trainer that I've met through derby. And she uh, came in and did an obstacle course where you had to make choices for holiday foods and then do a workout that would burn it off. And so that was a lot of fun too. But getting that community support is going to be key to making yourself more visible, their advertising in their gyms, and to ensuring the longevity of the program because they're bringing their own people into the library, people who may never have otherwise come. Um, I have a question. Um, from Lori, um, you mentioned how, yes, a lot of these programs are geared toward the 20 and 30 year olds and that, you know, the library is open to everyone. But what happens when, um, let's say, a teen shows up or a, a 70 year old shows up? Um, are, are they offended? Do they, do they fit in? Um, and, and I guess, how do you, how do you handle that, that situation? We haven't had any teens show up. Uh, for things like our book club. Um, for uh, the craft programs, it's fine. They, um, we don't worry about 
the younger kids being there. There's nothing that's um, too dangerous or offensive. For the um, book club, though, we have gotten people who weren't totally comfortable with the content. And um, actually, the last time that happened, I think the guy was in his 30s. Um, but he was, he was just very offended and never came back. So we pretty much let pe new people to the group know that this is sort of cult classics, um, and they, they find whether or not they want to, to attend. But no, um, some of our best book club members are, are probably 45, um, some of our favorites. So it's okay. not, it's just, a, it's just a design feature. We're trying to create something that, that isn't otherwise addressed through our programming, but definitely no, um, no restrictions there. Sure. So um, another thing with the book club, like, like Jessica was saying, we do have, like most library programs, the majority of our audience is female. So with the book club in particular, we've um, selected some sci-fi uh, books, which are not totally in our comfort range. It's not the sort of thing that Jess and I typically read, but it did get us a group of guys coming, and now our book club is more men than women, which oh, um, great. is unusual. Awesome. And what type of music do you play for punk rock Pilates? <laughs> um, here, this will be for Jessica. Uh, what do we play for punk rock Pilates? Uh, I use GroupShark to create playlists, and I, I curate all the playlists. So I had a summer one where I played um, only punk covers of super cheesy music. There was a Dickies cover of Nights in White Satin, and it's, you know, things that I like. Although, I have to say, the first punk rock aerobics I did after Jerry Brown was re-elected uh, was, did have the song from the Dead Kennedys, California Uberalis, in which Jello Biafra sings I'm Governor Jerry Brown, and I thought, oh, oh dear, that was, that was too timely. I shouldn't have done that. But I just go online and find things that I enjoy listening to, and then I match the movements to the songs so that everything is paced well. I've got warm-up songs and cool-down songs, and I try to make it a mix of things that people will recognize and people will enjoy, even if they've never heard it. Great. Uh, and not that I want to um, disrupt your timing, but I, I had another comment come in that I, I thought we could address. Um, Nancy says, I, I love a lot of these ideas, but um, what do you do in a community of 6,000 and with a library of 5,000 square feet and not a lot of space? Um, do you both feel that a lot of these ideas can be ad adaptable? Or I guess, how big are your, your branches? I guess I don't even, I don't even know. I worked at the North Sacramento Library, and that's the one where we did the, the first Friday program, so the retro crafts, the Bollywood. It was one room, so it was really small. That's why we chose to do those programs after hours, because it would have been very disruptive to regular library services. And then my current branch is slightly bigger, but it's in the middle of a park, and it's in a community center, so we have an auditorium and a meeting room that are available. But that is absolutely a challenge that needs to be addressed. And that is part of the reason we started doing the book club outside of the branch, so that we could have a little bit more space and a little bit more flexibility. But it is tricky to try to fit everything in. OK. Thank you. Yeah, um, and there's also a coffee outside the branch, which is nice. Um, <laughs> so we do things like um, this pub quiz, rather than try to bring people into the library where they're um, not going to be able to get a beer. Uh, we did, we borrowed somebody else's pub quiz. So one of the successful quizzes in town is at a pub called The Fox and Goose. And we um, asked if we could take it over one night and do all of the questions. So it was an alt library branded pub quiz. We promoted it online, but we reached an entirely new audience of 100 plus people who were already in the pub for the quiz. We did, um, the questions were all based on the Dewey Decimal System, so it was, it was fairly geeky. And then we handed out a lot of, um, Alt Library uh, swag. So that was that was fun. We do have larger branches here in Sacramento. So when we do a big event like speed dating, we're able to use our great big auditorium, um, which is at our central branch. Um, and uh, one of our best programs is Haunted Stacks. Haunted Stacks is one of my favorites, and this is. Get other people to do your work. Lori and I had this idea because 
we have a, a room at the downtown library called the Sacramento Room. It's our historical archives, it's local history, it's signed copies of, of classic books. They have, um, what is the binding? They have a, a book that's bound in marble with teeth set into it, you know, all kinds of interesting collections like that. And it's also supposed to be haunted. It's been featured on ghost hunter shows, things like that. So we thought it would be really fun to have an evening program called Haunted Stacks, where we had ghosts throughout the archives. It would be a, a way to get people into this Sacramento room, something that they don't normally see or use unless they're kids on a field trip or people who have nothing else to do. And it was a great chance to get people in there, get a chance to look around. So we populated it with ghosts. As you can see, we've got ghosts in the bottom corner there. Um, local staff willing to take on characters of people who had died or been killed in Sacramento to tell their stories and uh, just kind of make a fun Halloween type event. So we thought, hey, this will be fun, let's try it. Uh, downstairs in the Galleria, which is a, a big auditorium room, we plan to show Ghostbusters. So we had no idea how successful this program would be, but we wanted to try it out. And we ended up getting 100 people the first year that we did it. And Ghostbusters was playing. People would sign up for a tour. They would be taken upstairs, given the tour, come back down. We thought, OK, they'll be done. They'll leave. They sat back down, finished watching Ghostbusters, and stayed for the entire event. And it blew us away. So this was something that was our idea, but most of the work was actually done by other people in other departments. So it's, it's partnering, and partnering is important. You use your idea and their expertise to make a successful program. And the overwhelming response that we got to this led to making it an annual event. And we've done three of them now. They've all been incredibly popular. Uh, the first year, like I said, we showed Ghostbusters. The second year was, I don't remember. <laughs> The second year was Beetlejuice, and then this year we showed um, uh, a Vincent Price film. And because it has been a big, successful community event, it was featured on our local NPR station. And so we've seen a bit of a mix of audiences. I think the people who hear about it on Meetup are definitely our 20s and 30s audience, but a lot of the promotion that's done by the Sacramento Room. Um, and I should say that people who love local history use the Sacramento Room, not people who just have nothing to do. Um, those, those folks come to these programs because the, the actors, our staff, spend a lot of time researching each of the characters. So, um, and they're just great big hands. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Similarly, we've uh, each year in the Sacramento Room, off of Jessica's idea to do a, um, a 20s for the 20s, a fashion show. Um, that has spawned a yearly event exploring a, a different decade each year. So it started with the 1920s. And the Sacramento Room found a partner in the Art Deco Society who provided all of these outfits. This is all vintage, real clothes from the 1920s. Some of the shoes are, are not vintage because we have giant feet now. <laughs> um, and then they did one for the 1930s. And next year it'll be the 40s. So these um, have been quite popular, again, with our 20s and 30s audience, particularly the fashion show portion. But it's surrounded by um, scholarly talks about Sacramento history during each time period. So uh, those programs tend to bring in a different audience than the fashion show and the ones we really have to explain. But again, that sort of internal partnerships. All right, so another thing we've had great success with is um, doing food demos. Um, we have done raw food programs. Those tend to be the easiest in the library. And this is where um, I get to be the hand. So I um, tend to d pretend like I'm Julia Child and um, make a big mess in front of everybody and do the little cooking show. So try to be as entertaining as possible and remind people over and over and over that I'm neither a nutritionist nor a chef. chef. So um, it's been a one-time investment in all this cooking equipment, um, but we've gotten great program attendance. And this is one that we don't always do in a branch like Jessica's, um, the, the North Sac branch. 
we tend to find the branches that are larger and have a community room and access to the sink, which is very helpful. So um, in Sacramento, we do have 28 different library branches, and we are a county of you know, 1.3 million people. So I understand the, the question about trying to um, program for a smaller audience. It is definitely different. Um, for each community, but even though we have such a large um, county, some of our libraries are in very small places, so we can do something like this down in one of our Delta branches, for instance, and get a great turnout. So uh, we try to make our programs uh, replicable. And along those culinary lines, we did herb garden mixology. Non-alcoholic, but it's, again, something that we thought would be fun. So raw foods, was a lot of fun. People kept assuming that we were nutritionists no matter how many times we told them that we weren't. And we did. But they kept asking us, well, you know, how do you get your vitamin D? I don't, I don't know. I'm a librarian. This is as much as I know. I gave you everything. But we always had materials to support our, our talks. So we were able to hand out books and DVDs and say, take one of these. This can have, have information for you. And then we've got herb garden mixology. So mostly we use Lori's garden. Fortunately, she's a very good gardener and tried making different simple syrups and talked about matching flavor profiles and opportunities like that. So we had, you know, basil, rosemary, lemonade, and all sorts of other stuff. But that was really fun. It was a very popular program, and people definitely wanted to take things home and, and try it again. I think if we did this one in the future, we'd probably try to get a, a mixologist in, um, because there is a great cocktail culture here in Sacramento, um, as well as the gardening. So while we did it on the cheap, and, um, well, the practically free. Uh, I think it's one that would, would benefit from some outside partnerships. Okay, so this is the one that I mentioned earlier, the Bollywood Spectacular. And this is my big idea because I love Bollywood movies and I thought it would be super fun. This was one of the first flyers that we had made with our graphic designer, which turned out, no, actually Lori made this one, I lied. Lori made this one in multiple colors, and we had tear-off strips for the first time with our Alt Library website and the program time on it. So that was that was a an experiment with print materials, and I don't know how many how successful that was, but we ended up getting 60 people into my library after hours, and it was a total unexpected success. We had no idea that it would be that big. Uh, it was a first-time program with a huge reward. And also, one of the first times we spent much money. So we had money. We spent about $200 on this program. So a little over our target of $1.50 per person. But we provided food. We had a local Indian restaurant who was willing to give us discounted sweets. Lori made chai in her house. Bless her heart. I did a dance lesson. We paid a henna artist. And then we had the movie. And it was so much fun. And this was one of the ones where basically everyone who came was in our target demographic. So we were absolutely blown away by the success. And fortunately, our library director decided to drop by that night so she could see it, which helps ensure our continued success for sure. And then we've got, uh, for the spell of it, this one I believe was Lori's idea. Other libraries have done spelling bees. I think we got it from Genre X. And also, insanely popular. We did get a graphic designer for this one. She made the flyer for us. And it was super cheap. Doesn't really cost anything to put together a spelling bee. It was super fun, and it was a great turnout. Lori and I were the judges, the, the, the judges, and oh my gosh, the tension when people are spelling is horrible. It was so, we, we had to look down. It was so unsettling. But there was a hotel up the street from my library called the Greens Hotel, and all of their rooms have a letter hanging in front of them. So I had gone over there and asked them to donate a room as a prize. They ended up donating a room with a bottle of wine and a special you know, honeymoon package. So ask for things, you will get them. But this is a basically free program. You can spend money on the prizes or not. But as you can see, the grand prize was Scrabble Deluxe, um, Fame and Glory. Second and third, we were handing out Alt Library swag, stuff that we'd already purchased that we're really just trying to get rid of, but again, is a way to get our brand out into the community. 
And then the first one eliminated got a dictionary. We didn't want them to feel too bad. And then again, titles can make or break you. So super happy fun karaoke dance party. This is one of my favorite flyers that our graphic designer made. It is just so incredibly cute and pink and the little watermelon cap, I don't know. So this was another in our first Friday series. And we were very careful to have adults only on there because it's a gaming program. You know, immediately you think, oh, teens, kids, whatever. But we specified this is for adults only. We did get adults only, which was fantastic. And it was really a lot of fun. People had a great time playing these games and singing karaoke. But the name, Super Happy Fun Karaoke Dance Party, the graphics and communications department kind of pushed back and they said, you know, can we cut it down? It's a little bit, no, we can't. This is the idea and this is why it's fun. And it ended up being another very successful program. So we have been uh, very fortunate to get a graphic designer on staff, um, now an award-winning graphic designer. We applied for the National Library Week um, Scholastic grant last year. Uh, the theme was, You Belong at Your Library. So we decided to take a GLBTQIA focus with this and create programming for our uh, GLBT audience of Sacramento. Our designer did these posters. The grant was actually for promotional materials. So unusually, we were able to spend $3,000 on uh, promotional materials. So the picture at the top, were, that was on buses around town. We had window clings with the small thing at the bottom. So though it's not Alt Library branded, it was definitely an Alt Library program um, that had a system focus this time. And the photographer was a friend of mine. All of the people in the picture are friends of mine. It is just using what you have. People are always willing to help. And the photographer, fortunately for us, ended up getting work from that. She started working for a couple of local businesses after they'd seen her work on the bus. And so that was, that was really good. I felt really good about that one and very pleased because we were not able to pay her. But she is, uh, she's a good supporter of the library for sure. So what we really want to do is encourage you all to think outside the box um, in your programming and think for your community. You know, like I said, we, we, do, we are pretty fortunate in having a, a greatly varied community. So a lot of our different kind of program ideas have been successes. But um, there's something that's going to work for your uh, library. And if you have ideas, we'd love for you to share them in the comments, um, and we'll steal them and try to give uh, you credit uh, where we can. And we, while that's going on, we wanted to just take you through a few of the things that are coming up for Alt Library. So we talked a little bit about Alt Prom. This is really taking up a lot of our focus. Um, we're very excited about the possibility of having a uh, decorating committee which we're going to post this as a job on Volunteer Match to try to get more uh, Friends Vault Library and to get people to decorate the space. So that one's exciting. And with the Alt Prom, this is going to be our Alt Library uh, Friends fundraiser. And we're going to have the ticket price the same as a membership to be a Friends member. So the idea is Friends members will get in for free. So do you want to pay for a ticket for this one-time event, or do you want to be a Friends member for the whole year? Suddenly, I think that our Friends membership will grow hugely. This is something that we might do should we ever get a grant. Um, silent discos are, well, disco parties with everybody wearing headsets. So they're all dancing to the same music, um, but nobody can hear it. You can only hear it on the headphones which I think will be perfect for a library setting. And there are places in California that rent these um, headset systems. It tends to be about $1,500, so we haven't found the money for it yet. But I can't imagine anything funnier than people dancing around the library. All dancing in sync. There's some great videos on, on YouTube if you want to watch it. It's um, a little bit embarrassing. But it's fun. Lori is very, very interested in the silent disco. I would love to see it happen, but she, she has a passion. I think it will. Uh, mustache party. 
been done, not by us. Maybe we'll do it, but mustaches are popular, as you well know, ubiquitous mustache everywhere. This one, uh, moving in a manicure. So inspiration for programs comes from anywhere. Uh, I drove past a cosmetology school and thought, what could they do for the library? And, you know, if they're in cosmetology school, they tend to need to practice their techniques on, on people who are willing. So we thought maybe we could have people come in. We could show a, a ladies' movie like The Women, which if you've never seen is fantastic classic movie. I, I don't recommend watching the newer one. I haven't. But the old one with Norma Shearer and Joan Crawford, and just a splendid movie. But having these cosmetology students come in, get the practice that they need by offering free manicures, and it's a way to get people into the library who don't normally come. We're also hoping to piggyback on other existing community events like Hunt the Grid, which was a bicycle scavenger hunt. We want um, adult library friends to get involved or to have a station on this hunt is our question. Um, as Jessica and I, our jobs have changed quite a lot over the past four, three to four years. We used to work together in a programming department and now the programming department is just me and the person who books external presenters. So, um, and my job has changed to being partnership coordinator, Jessica's a branch manager. So each time these things change, we change our focus and our ability to do alt library programming. So now that partnerships is part of my mandate, I'll be trying to seek out more uh, partnerships to keep this thing going. So. Ultimately, the key is to show up everywhere. The more visible you are, the more people know about you, about the library, and about the programs that you can offer. So this is how to find us. Uh, my email is at the top. Lori's email is the second. Altlibrary.com is our blog. It's not controlled by our communications department. We're still kind of trying to keep that secret because you know, the library wants the consistent message to be coming out of communications. We got permission to do this one before that was the case, and so we're doing our best to maintain control of that because it is very targeted toward that age range. The things that we post on there are, are very folksy, they're very us, and we don't want them to have that generic message coming out. So we're, we're trying to stay under the radar with that. And then like we showed earlier, the meetup is, is how we get a lot of people coming into our programs and how they find out about it. Sends out a mass email to all of your members every time you post a program. So the best way to promote to your 400 plus people, post it on your meetup. All right. And again, this Thanks is Jamie. Um, lots of great ideas. Yeah, again, if any of you have questions um, for Lori or Jessica, um, feel free to use your question box. Or if you are mic'd, um, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Or if you have ideas that you've done for this audience or uh, programs that could be adaptable to this audience, please um, share those as well. Um, does the altlibrary.com blog contain um, information with these ideas, Lori and Jessica, or is there a website? Um, yeah, Alt Library has the, the basic description, the how we sell it to people on there. Uh, but you're welcome to email us if you want details on how to do it yourself because we are, just like we shamelessly steal from everyone, we're also <laughs> willing for them to steal from us. We love to share any information people want because we know what has worked for us and what really hasn't, and we would love to help you avoid making the same mistakes we did. Sure. Um, Angela said they did Home Brewing 101 at their library. She said it was very successful, and they had a home brewing expert come in and demonstrate. And I think you guys had something like that, too, that you talked about at PLA. We tried to get it, but we haven't been able to get that going yet. It's something we're very interested in because home brewing is very popular here in town. So we did all this work trying to get a home brewer to come out, and then at the very last, uh, we had a facilities issue and they wouldn't let us do it. But we're still hoping to do it. Sometime. Okay. Um, does Alt Library have a Facebook account? Um, our friends has a Facebook. Our friends group does. Um, our social media team, for a little bit, Jessica touched on this, um, we have some really strict rules about how social media happens with the Sacramento Public Library. So none of our branches have their own Facebook page. We have one group page, and then each 
branch can have their own little little thing. But we don't we don't have Facebook. We do have Twitter, which we don't use much. Okay. So you really yeah. kind of rely on your your meetup. Um, I just. Uh, saw a question come in from David. He said, you mentioned Meetup, email, blog, and Facebook. Are there other communication uh, mediums that have been useful for you, electronic or otherwise? Yes. Um, when we post things on the community calendars for our local newspaper, the SACB, um, occasionally they look through their calendars to uh, find things to feature. And the same is true for uh, the Sacramento News and Review. So that's been a great way to get our message out there. And like we said earlier, if you have a creative title or something like Bad Art Night, they tend to print those in their in their print versions as well. And um, uh, we had a, a Rainbow Family egg hunt as part of our You Belong at Your Library, and that ended up getting included in a list of the newspaper's local egg hunts. So that was really great because all we did was post it in the online calendar, and then suddenly it's on the front page of the paper. We didn't really have to do anything. We didn't have to contact anybody. We just listed it online everywhere we could do it, and suddenly promotion. Carrie with the Friends of the Library Sheet from the Circulation Desk. Carrie with the Friends of the Library from the Circulation Desk. Thank you. <laughs> have you. Have you done something for this age group? And did it turn out to be a total flop? Do you want to talk about any, not that we want to, dwell on, oh, no, on those no, things, no. but... <laughs> um, hipster Crafts was a, a huge failure because we called it Hipster Crafts. And okay. um, initially, the book club happened in bars, um, and that was okay, but the bars, it's a cool idea. Um, and, well, in that, I mean, it makes us feel cool. At least that's what we're aiming at. Um, <laughs> but... Um, that it was just too noisy, so we had to go to the um, book club and the, the coffee shop. We also had, and this was done by a different department. Um, our our guys here had a gaming, a monthly gaming event. Um, a couple of our uh, circulation staff, and they did a Call of Duty game uh, competition, which gathered way too much, way too much of the wrong kind of attention. So while it was a hugely successful program for young younger men, 18 and up, uh, mostly younger 20s, like 80 people participated, I think. Wow. Um, the Veterans for Peace protested it, and Sydney oh. came to Sacramento to protest it. So it actually put our director in a really awkward position. Um, I've also written a little bit about using gaming in libraries, and I think this is the kind of... Um, an instance where I think if our administration had known what kind of game it was to begin with, they may not have approved it. But to their great credit, they totally stood behind this game. And that was one we promoted through our library that we didn't do ourselves. Um, it just ended up being a bit of a, a, a firestorm of publicity. Great. We also have a tendency to work by the policy of ask for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> if we know something's going to be a little bit questionable, we tend to, to show all the, the fluff and light of it and then not necessarily tell them exactly what it involves, but we, again, have been very, very lucky with that. Excellent. Uh, well, we are out of time, unfortunately, but um, you both shared so many great ideas and your marketing materials and, and graphics are, are just awesome. I've seen a lot of great um, compliments and comments come through. Um, with that. Um, so again, Jessica's and Lori's email is listed. If you have more questions for them, feel free to email them. Um, I want to thank you both for sharing these ideas today. Um, again, it's unfortunate we couldn't bring you here, but we are glad you were able to share your ideas um, via the, the website and the, through the, the webinar format. So um, thank you all for participating today. Um, I hope you have a, a great day and a, a, a great week. Thank you.